Welcome, overcomers. Uh, it's good to have you uh, join me again today. Uh, today's lesson is going to be on overcoming confusion with wisdom. And I think all of us feel like we're really living in confusing times. Um, we listen to broadcasts and we hear one thing that the virus is going away, then we hear another thing that the virus is getting worse. Uh, there's great debate on whether the states should open or whether they should close. Uh, so these are very difficult times for all of us. It's very confusing to know what to believe and how to process all of the information that we're going to get. So uh, today we're, uh, I'll just do a little bit of review with you and um, we're continuing on in David Jeremiah's book on overcomers. And so I'll just uh, start our PowerPoint with you today and, um, and start that um, so that we can walk through this together. So we're covering the six different um, pieces of armor that Paul has suggested that we need to put on in order to stand against the um, schemes of the devil. That's the word he uses. Um, Satan has strategies and plans to be able to try to intimidate us, to overcome us, uh, to confuse us. And so each of these pieces of armor are very critical uh, to help us take a stand against those kind of strategies and to be able to be victorious in our own Christian lives. Uh, so the first one we looked at was... Uh, well, we, we've covered a lot of these, but uh, the pieces of armor are the helmet of salvation, uh, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the sword of truth, then the sword of the spirit, the shield of faith, and then to have our feet shod with the gospel of peace. Uh, we first looked at the Roman belt. Uh, this, was, uh, this was a critical piece of the Roman armor uh, that went around your waist, it girded everything together, held everything in place. Uh, your sword, uh, your knife, uh, other pieces of equipment uh, would be connected to this that would help us uh, to have the support and protection that we need. And our study then, we talked about overcoming falsehood with truth. Uh, so there's a real battle for truth today in terms of our society. Uh, where it's hard to know what to believe and who really is telling uh, the truth. The second piece of armor we looked at was the breastplate. And this went over your chest and your uh, body, the upper part of your body. And it was the cover, the lungs and the heart. And we talked about how the lungs and the heart are symbolic of the seat of our emotions and the breath of life. And our topic at that point in time was overcoming evil with good. And so we looked at the life of David and him being pursued by Saul and how David turned to righteousness and rather than allowing evil to come into his heart, he, he demonstrated righteousness and extending grace uh, to Saul when he could have easily killed uh, Saul. The third piece that we looked at was the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace overcoming anxiety with peace. And we're all living in very anxious days today. There are those things that trigger anxiety with us. And we know that anxiety has an incredible impact on us emotionally and physically and spiritually, especially on the physical side. Those who live with anxiety and can deal with anxiety, high blood pressure, a greater chance of stroke, many other side effects of not dealing with anxiety properly. And so overcoming anxiety with peace is a very important part. And we talked about how God provides not only his peace for us, and that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, but then as we enter into prayer, we can experience the peace of God. And then when we walk in obedience to God's word, then the God of peace comes alongside of us. Last week, we looked at the shield of faith, taking up the shield of faith that we may quench the fiery darts of the wicked one and overcoming fear with faith. And so one of the things that Satan really tries to do is intimidate us. He, he wants to create a sense of doubt in our lives. He, he wants to overwhelm us with circumstances. And so 
he's always throwing these darts to make us question ourselves and are we really doing the right thing and does God really love me and is God really true and did Jesus really die for me and what is salvation really for me and so those are questions that he likes to place in our minds to cause us to doubt our faith and so to upset us and makes us vulnerable and the shield that we talked about here was the long oblong shield which uh, protected the whole body and uh, it could be able to withstand then the fiery darts of the wicked one and we took away some takeaways uh, for that lesson number one that we must take up the shield of faith it's not something that God does for us and then the shield of faith is only as strong as the substance it's made of and therefore we need to rehearse the substance of our faith and the substance of our faith is the word of God, the fact that Jesus Christ was born, lived on this earth, died on the cross, that he was raised from the dead. Uh, so those are historical evidence that uh, what God has said in his word is true. And so as we believe his word and build our lives on his word, then that becomes the substance of our faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The bedrock of our faith is hearing and obeying the word of God. Number four, facing our fears strengthens our faith. So as we face our fears and we see God provide the victory, then it gives us more confidence the next time when we're facing uncertainty and circumstances that are trying to overwhelm us. Quenching the fiery darts from the wicked one is a skill to be learned. And so, once again, it's always being on guard and learning how to use that shield of faith to deflect what Satan is saying. So when Satan wants to create a doubt in our mind, we have to say, no, we don't believe this. This is a lie. What we're going to believe is what God said in his word, and that's what I'm going to base my life on. And then we cannot win the battle by ourselves, so we need others to bring their shields of faith alongside of us. So that's where the beauty of community. We need other believers to stand with us. So as we mentioned before in Ephesians chapter 6, the pronouns there are all in the plural. So it's that we're working together as a unit. The Roman army was an incredible fighting unit because it learned how to stand together and be able to overcome the enemy by working together and lending their strength to each other and that's really what we need to be able to do as well. Today we're going to be looking at the helmet of salvation or as First Thessalonians talks about it, the helmet, the hope of salvation. The Roman helmet was early on made of metal, uh, sometimes made of leather in the early days and it was fortified with pieces of metal and it had to protect the head from any kind of critical blow. So as you realize if someone could hit you with a sword or whatever, um, that blow had to be defected, deflected, otherwise uh, it would be fatal to you. So it was a very strategic uh, piece of armor for us. Uh, helmets also, the more uh, uh, higher up you were in the Roman army, why uh, the more beautiful the helmets were made out of mostly metal, some of them had large plumes on top of them as well. Uh, and so they usually had cheek plates that came down alongside of the cheek in order to protect the face, often had a bridge that came down over the nose. So once again, it was able to protect uh, the face from any kind of uh, blow and be able to give uh, protection for the eyes. And so putting on the helmet of salvation was to protect us against uh, the things that are going to be after our mind. So a helmet protects a soldier against damaging and deadly blows to the head. Spiritually speaking, the helmet of salvation provides hope and protects the mind against anything that would disorient it or destroy the Christian, such as discouragement or deceit or even confusion. That's one of the big things that David Jeremiah stresses in his book of how Satan loves to get us confused. And when we're uncertain in our mind and our mind is reeling, then we're vulnerable. The helmet also protected the eyes of the soldier, enabled him to maintain 
a physical vision. And so spiritually, it's the same thing, that our vision needs to be fixed on Jesus Christ. And our goal is to press forward without distractions and without detours or confusion, but placing our hope and our faith and our trust uh, in him uh, so that we are able to stand firm uh, as Satan tries to attack us. The helmet also protects us and keeps us our focus where it needs to be. So as in Hebrews it says, keeping your eyes on Jesus Christ and finishing the race strong, that's what the helmet does. It keeps us focused. So when we're wearing the helmet, it doesn't matter what Satan throws at us. Uh, we know that what we're fighting for, we know that our salvation and our deliverance is a gift from someone that is greater than our enemy. So the battle really isn't in ours, the battle is God's. And as long as we keep our head in the game, then we're gonna be able to overcome uh, what Satan wants to throw at us. The helmet of, all, helmet of salvation also means that we don't have to live in fear of Satan. When he tries to disorient us or to destroy us, the helmet reminds us that our victory will come not from us, but from God who rules the universe and the God that wants to give us that victory. And so we know that we already have victory in Jesus Christ, that he overcame the grave, he overcame sin, he overcame Satan, and therefore we have victory in Christ Jesus. So one of the key passages that um, David Jeremiah mentions in his book is Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And, and I want to just read that for us. And then you notice I've highlighted a number of phrases uh, in that passage. And I'd like to take time to look at each of those phrases because they're, they're very important for us in terms of controlling our mind and, and being able to have our mind in the game. So he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable perfect will of God. For I say through the grace that was given to me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but so think as to think soberly, according as God has dealt to each man a measure of faith. So I'd like to take some time and walk us down through each of these words that we highlighted. Uh, Hebrews, I mean, uh, Romans chapter 12, uh, Paul is coming to the end of his arguments. Romans is the greatest book to help us understand salvation. And so as he's covered how we were all in sin, all of sin and come short of the glory of God, how God has provided salvation for us, and not only for us, but also for the Jews, and Gentiles, so his salvation is great, and then how through the Holy Spirit he has sealed that salvation into our lives. Now he comes to chapter 12, and so he's saying, on behalf of everything that I have uh, told you about, I now beseech you, all right, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. The word beseech is a word parakaleo, and paras means alongside, and kaleo means to call. And so Paul uh, was an example of this to believers, uh, especially in 1 Thessalonians chapter um, 2, verses 10 through 12. And I'd like to take just a moment to read that to you, because uh, once again, Paul is an example of how um, he came alongside of the believers. He says uh, in uh, verses 10 through 12, You are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave toward you believers, just as you know how we were exhorting, so that he was saying, I'm showing you the way, all right, encouraging, that's parakaleo, how we came alongside. So we not only showed you the way, 
though we came alongside of you in order to walk that path with you. And then imploring, he says, we were willing to join you in your lives, even to lay down our lives for you. The word here in the Greek is maturios, which is a word that means martyr. So it's saying we were willing to lay down our lives. We witnessed with our very lives to you, he says, so that imploring each one of you as a father with his own children, so that you may walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So that, that word beseech means to call alongside. So we're not on this journey alone where God is calling us together to come alongside of each other and to help each other become that living sacrifice that God wants us to be. We also can't do this on our own. So it's interesting that in John chapter 16, verse 7, when Jesus is ready to leave his disciples, he says, when I leave, I'm going to send to you a paracleto, a comforter, a helper, one who is coming alongside of you and who will guide you into all truth and will be able to give you understanding. So once again, the whole idea of beseeching us is coming alongside to help us understand so that we might be able to walk in obedience before the Lord. Then he says, I'd like you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. The word present here is another word similar, parahistemi. So para means to place alongside or upon. Uh, this is the technical term for presenting the Levitical victims um, for offering. So, so whenever someone put an offering upon an altar. So they brought it and they had to place it either on the offering or alongside of the offering, etc. It's used also in Romans 6, uh, chapter, chapter 6, verses 13 through 19. Uh, so he says there, neither present your members unto sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves unto God as alive from dead, so that makes us living sacrifices, as alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So in Romans 6, he's emphasizing to us that uh, we are now, in a sense, been raised and we to new life, and so we are alive in Christ. And so he says we're alive from the dead in Christ, so therefore he wants us to use our body as instruments of righteousness. He also talks about a living sacrifice. Uh, so this term distinguishes the sacrifice from the Levitical sacrifice, which was dead when it was offered. We are raised alive with Christ, and therefore we are living sacrifices. Once again, going back to Romans chapter 6, verse 11, says, even so reckon yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive unto God in Jesus Christ. So we are alive, we're living sacrifices, we're a demonstration of what Christ has done in our behalf. The penalty for sin has been paid, a death is overcome, we no longer have to fear death, but we have eternal life in Jesus Christ, and therefore he says, I want you to walk in, in a sense, new life, which is living sacrifices, being able to demonstrate the power of Jesus Christ through our lives as we live for him. And then he talks about reasonable service. The Greek word here means logical. So in light of what Christ has done for us, what is the logical thing that we should do to honor him? And the idea here is to present our bodies as instruments of righteousness, to demonstrate that we are set free from sin, and therefore we're overcoming sin and death, and we're alive in Christ. He also says, be not conformed. So this is the same term that is used in the transfiguration of Christ. Uh, Jesus reflected the very glory of God. It burst forth from within him. Therefore, we're not, allow, we're not to allow the world to burst through our flesh, but he's saying instead we should allow Jesus Christ to shine through us. 
So whatever is inside of us is going to come out. So a friend of mine who was from India says, whenever you're bumped, whatever is inside of you will come out of you. So he's saying Jesus Christ should be, in a sense, shining out of us. So when instead of being conformed to the world or pressed into the mold of the world, uh, we're supposed to demonstrate, in a sense, Jesus Christ and his life and his power. So the term here also is used for pressing something into a mold, making it exactly like the form of the mold. So Satan is trying to press us into the mold of the world. The interesting thing here in this passage is the Greek word for world normally used is cosmos. And we all cosmology is a study of the world, all right? So, so he usually uses cosmos, but here he uses aeon instead of cosmos. And the idea of aeon is, has to do with the age. So we're not to reflect the current age. So as, in a sense, we're very different than what life was like in the days of Paul, the first century church, and all down through history, every age has been different. And so Satan is always trying to get uh, his, his hooks into us to pull us in to, in a sense, the age that we're living in, all the things that could defer or to trap us or to get our eyes off of off of Jesus Christ. Uh, in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, he says, for us not to love the world, for the world is, is about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's, that's being conformed to this world. But we're supposed to walk in newness of life, and therefore let Jesus Christ shine through us rather than what is seen in the current age. We're also to be transformed. This is a wonderful word, word uh, metamorphosis. Uh, we all know of the chrysalis where the caterpillar becomes a butterfly in the chrysalis. So this is a true metamorphosis. So a uh, dictionary definition, a change of the form or nature of a thing or person into a completely different one by natural or supernatural means. So if you remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, um, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. So that's the metamorphosis. When you trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, he not only takes away your sin, but he puts his righteousness on you, and now he makes you a new creation. We talk about being born again. We're born out of sin and darkness into the light of Jesus Christ, and we are a new creation. Old things, those old habits, it's a process, all right? It's not something that happens immediately, but it's a process. We call it sanctification, where God continues to work on our lives, and the old things pass away, we become new creations demonstrating the power of Christ to overcome sin in our lives. So the new birth is a radical transformation of every aspect of our lives. That's the kind of transformation that Paul is speaking here. He's also saying how this transformation works. So here now we're getting back to the helmet of salvation, which has to do with our mind, protecting the mind and the head. So he says, by the renewing of your mind. So the process of transformation is dependent on the renewing or renovation of the mind. This is not something that we can do on our own, but requires the assistance of the Holy Spirit. So as we allow the Holy Spirit to guide us into truth, and as we believe that truth and allow that truth to become a foundation in our lives, then we're able to discern what is right and wrong, true and false, and good and evil. Titus 3, 5, and 6 gives us insight into this process. So he says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. 
So the first, there's the washing of regeneration. This is the rebirth. When we are born of the Spirit, we are cleansed by the washing of the water of the Word. And then there's the renewing of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit now guides us into truth by which we can discern good and evil, true and false, right and wrong. So that renewing process is that sanctification where he's turning our lives around, taking those old things away and replacing them with new habits, new insights, giving us an opportunity to walk in newness of life. So it has to do with the renewing of your mind and allowing the Holy Spirit to guide you and direct you uh, in your life. He also in this passage says that you may prove. The word means here to test or discern what is the will of God. So we now have a new capacity to discern what is God's desire for us. So we often hear the question, how, do we, how are we able to understand the will of God? So I want to read this passage out of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Because I think it's important for us, once again, to understand. Paul is talking here about wisdom. And he's saying that the wisdom of the world, um, people uh, can't understand the wi I'm sorry, the wisdom of God. Let me just pick it up here. For yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. A wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are passing away. So remember he talks about how Satan is trying to conform us to the, the patterns of this age, all right? But we speak God's wisdom in a ministry, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood it, they would, have, they would not have crucified our Lord, the glory, Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen, and ear has not heard, and which we have not entered into the heart of man, all that God has preferred for those who love him. Now listen to this. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among a man knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of a man, which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things freely given to us by God which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Holy Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no man. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he should instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. So the Holy Spirit is that connection between our minds and the mind of God. So we only know our own mind, but the Holy Spirit acts as that intermediary and helps us understand the deep things of God. So as he reveals God's will to us, so the Holy Spirit teaches us in a combination of spiritual thoughts and spiritual words, and therefore we can know God's will for our lives. So when he says that you may prove, in a sense, the will of God, what he's saying here is that as we rely on the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit understands our thoughts, God's thoughts, and now through spiritual words and spiritual thoughts, he brings those together so that we can understand what God desires for us to be able to do. So then he also exhorts us to think soberly. So the Greek word here means to be of a sound mind. The key for transforming the mind is not to think more highly 
nor less than ourselves, but to see ourselves as God sees us. So most of us memorize Romans 12, 1 and 2. Very few of us ever memorize Romans 12, 3. And the idea here is that when we inflate our image or deflate our image, we distort what God has been doing in our lives. God knows our strengths. He knows our weaknesses. He knows exactly where we are spiritually in our lives. Satan's goal is to distort that, all right? So he either wants us to become proud, all right, thinking ourselves more highly, and as we become proud, we become vulnerable because now we're standing on our own strength rather than God's strength. And I think also the, the opposite of that is true, that we're not to think any less than ourselves, all right? It's, it's, it's if we think less of ourselves, then we're actually distorting. It's the poor me. Oh, don't you feel sorry? I can't do this. And so rather than ex expecting God's power to come into our lives, and for God to stand with us and to provide the strength, the insight, the wisdom, the discernment that we need, we, in a sense, distort that. And that allows Satan then to have a field day in our lives, and we become vulnerable to his influence. So thinking soberly is trying to see yourself as God sees you. He knows your weaknesses. He knows your strength. You don't have to inflate or deflate those at all but just trust what God has done. And as you walk in obedience, knowing your own strengths and weaknesses, God then empowers you to be able to be overcomers. So from Romans 12, one through three, we've learned that the helmet of salvation provides transformation by the renewing of the mind, which helps us understand the will of God and be able to discern the schemes of Satan. The helmet of salvation also provides wisdom, which is the skill of using the knowledge of the Word of God and applying it to daily life. Knowledge is the understanding of truth based on the Word of God, but wisdom is the ability to apply that knowledge to daily life. So we did Ecclesiastes not too long ago, and we talked about um, when Solomon was uh, given an opportunity to ask for anything he wanted, and he asked for wisdom, the word chokmah, uh, which is knowledge, the ability to make right choices at the opportune time. The consistency of making the right choices is an indication of spiritual maturity. All right, so, so the prerequisite for this wisdom is the fear of the Lord, Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. So the fear of the Lord can be defined as the continual awareness that our loving Heavenly Father is watching and evaluating everything that we think, say, and do. So knowing that God is watching us. Now in the Bible, the word translated fear can mean a great variety of things. Uh, it can refer to terror, uh, one who feels in a frightening uh, situation in Deuteronomy chapter 2 when God was speaking to Moses and the mountain would quake and everyone was very much afraid. So there's that kind of fear. It can also mean respect. To fear someone is to respect the way a servant fears his master or serves him faithfully. Fear can also denote the reverence or awe a person feels in the presence of greatness, uh, such as in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 5. The fear of the Lord, then, is the combination of all of these. I think we stand in awe. We also know that God is a righteous judge, and therefore we need to fear when we disobey him. We also, in a sense, respect him because he, we know his greatness and we know his power, and therefore we need to be obedient to what he's asking us to do. In order to develop the fear of the Lord, we have to recognize God for who he is. We must glimpse with our spirits the power, the might, the beauty, the brilliance of the Lord God Almighty. All right, so those who fear the Lord have a continual awareness of him, a deep reverence for him, and a sincere commitment to obey him. 
So the other passage that Dr. Jeremiah mentioned in his book, and I want to take some time to walk through that with you, is James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. And once again, I've highlighted some words here, and we'll talk about those uh, quite quickly as we work through the end of this passage. So he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all that they do. So if we lack wisdom, uh, this is a very interesting term in the Greek. Uh, when I looked this word up, I was surprised because it's a banking term. It means it says that if your account lacks sufficient funds to pay your bills. So if you find yourself lacking wisdom, then believers, in a sense, if we're not paying attention, if we're allowing the world to draw us away and we get caught up with our thoughts in terms of the world rather than thinking about who Jesus Christ is and trying to think about righteousness and holiness and those kind of things that are part of the character of who God is and who God wants us to be, then in a sense we can lack that wisdom and we lose that ability to discern what Satan is really trying to do in our lives. So we don't want to have that lack of wisdom. So he says, if you lack it, if your account is short, you should ask. So the word here is very intense. It's not just a casual asking, but it's more like craving or begging or seeking diligently. Uh, this is an imperative, which means James is commanding us as believers to diligently ask God for wisdom. Uh, G James, in his book, is going to talk a lot about testing and our faith and the whole idea of faith and works and us being obedient and carrying out our faith in our lives. And so he's saying as you're, as you're facing testing, your faith, the remedy for that is a strong faith, and therefore we need to have that intense desire for wisdom that only uh, God can give to us. He also tells us then that God gives generously. The wording here indicates that God is not miserly but gives liberally to those in need. This verse is amplified in uh, chapter 1, verse 17, uh, where it's revealed that God gives us good things. And let me just uh, read that passage for you. It says down in verse 17, Every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow, in the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, so that we might be, as it were, first fruits among his creatures. So, so this word, this uh, passage here tells us that the Father of lights wants to give us good gifts. And the kind of gifts he gives us there's no darkness, there's no shadow, there's nothing of the world in it. They are pure, they are wholesome, they are holy, they are righteous, they are peaceable, they are just. So those are the kinds of gifts that he wants to place in our lives. Where Satan always wants to put into our lives anger and malice and, and envy and jealousy and those kinds of things is what he wants to put into our lives. So he says, you have to ask in faith. So faith is the attitude of complete reliance on the person being asked, no doubting. So when he used the word no doubting, it's another way of saying that there has to be complete trust and confidence in the person being asked. And he says, otherwise you're going to become double-minded. And the word that James uses here means to have a double spirit, like anxiety where there's two spirits that are pulling in the opposite direction. This is exactly the kind of spirit Satan is looking for. 
It is the spirit of confusion, which is the seedbed for doubt and fear, and therefore we become intimidated, we become overwhelmed, and we're easy prey in terms of what Satan wants to do to us. So as we've looked at these two great passages, Romans chapter 12, uh, 1 through 3, and then uh, James uh, chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, uh, here's some of the takeaways then. The helmet of salvation is critical to protect the mind and to maintain the focus for the battle against Satan. So once again, you have to put on the helmet of salvation. God does not do that for you. You have to do it. And so part of that is the discernment of putting on Jesus Christ, of, of making sure that our mind is fixed on him. The battle is always for the mind, and therefore we must constantly be in the process of asking the Holy Spirit to renew our minds. So just as it says in, Roman, in John chapter 16, that the comforter, the paraclete, has come alongside to guide us into all truth and to strengthen us and to give us wisdom and discernment. And so we need to be relying on the Holy Spirit. So putting on that helmet of salvation means I'm not going to rely on my own wisdom. I'm going to rely on the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. And then we must think soberly and see ourselves as God sees us in order to maintain a perspective on life. So the moment we inflate or deflate who we are, we're making ourselves vulnerable to the attack of Satan. We must seek not to just acknowledge, we must seek not just knowledge, but wisdom, where we apply what God has shown to us in daily life. So reading the Word of God, studying the Word of God isn't just for knowledge. It's when we are obedient to the Word of God. It's when we carry out the Word of God. It's when we're applying the Word of God that it gives us maturity to be able to discern that which is right and wrong, true and false, good and evil. We cannot afford to have insufficient wisdom in our bank account when facing the trials and testing of life. So therefore, we have to ask our Heavenly Father, the Father of lights above, who gives those good gifts. And we need to rest on the truth that the God who is the Father of lights is desirous to give us all that we need to overcome whatever trials we may face. So I hope you'll join me for our time of discussion uh, at five o'clock. Uh, as we'll have an opportunity to answer some of the questions that I've given to you, and uh, we can discuss together some of your insights into these passages and be able to um, have the opportunity of sharing and, um, and being able to discuss what God is doing in your lives.